to the Taoist Arts Organization International Podcast. This is our Dowie Talks Expert Series. My guest today is Chris Marshall of Shoreline Tai Chi in Washington State. Uh, Chris is a Yang-style Tai Chi practitioner and championship competitor with numerous gold medals to his name in forms practice as well as fixed step, moving step, and freestyle push hands. Uh, Chris, thanks for joining me today. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. So we we found you from your site and your YouTube channel, and you have some pretty impressive, uh, you know, competition footage and and things of that nature up on your YouTube channel. But um, was Tai Chi your first martial art? How did you get started in martial arts? Well, you know, that's a hell of a story. And uh, I've never told the full story in public before. I think I might try to share it with you. Uh, Fantastic. Real scoop. All right, awesome. Um, uh, but before I get started on that, I guess I'd like to say uh, two things. Uh, first, it, it might come out a little bit chaotically because, as I've I, as I said, I've never really tried to share it before, and it's it's uh, a bit of a, a bit of a tale. Uh, so I'll, I'll appreciate your patience if it seems like I'm jumping back and forth a little bit. Uh, please feel free to interrupt me. And I guess the other thing I'll say is just because you know this is a discussion uh, about martial arts. I want to say that this story is actually true. This is not a, a martial arts true story. This is a true, true. <laughs> okay, understood. Yeah, gotcha. There's no wink and nod. Okay, I got you. All right. All right. So uh, uh, let me try to condense this down to, I don't know, maybe we'll go for uh, 20 minutes or so. We'll see, okay. we'll see how it goes. Uh, this, <clears throat> this story, let's start off uh, in second grade. Okay. Let's start off in second grade, where I was uh, elected boss of the second grade Kung Fu gang and how that happened. Okay, sounds good. All right, great. So uh, we need to start with a little bit of background uh, information. Uh, firstly, that uh, there were gangs on the playground uh, in my middle, in my elementary school. This was uh, this was the 80s. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in the 80s, uh, Kids and particularly young boys were expected to self-organize. <laughs> you guys go and figure it out. Uh, they would throw you out on the playground and just whatever happens, happens. It wasn't like uh, it is today. Um, and then the other bit of background information that is helpful to understand here is that uh, uh, Seattle uh, was, and to some extent still is, a segregated city. And so in the north end of Seattle, you have primarily uh, white people. And then on the south end of Seattle, you have uh, a lot more minorities. And this is relevant to the story because uh, the public schools had a policy of uh, busing people to and fro in order to try to achieve uh, what they thought was the appropriate uh, racial balance in the school. And um, yeah, so <laughs> so here's here that how that actually fell out uh, in practice. Um, my elementary school was in the north end. Uh, the home the 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 home kids, so to speak, were mostly white people, and then we had a lot of Asian kids who were bussed in from the south end uh, and came to join us uh, at the school. And uh, so you know. The social life uh, of a second grader is is like this: you play some games, and then you talk about stuff you saw on on TV or right. stuff that right. your older brother and sister uh, keyed you into. Right. And so, in the eighties, that would be things like uh, what interests a second grade boy: uh, action movies, uh, Stallone, Schwarzenegger, uh, the A Team, uh, Dukes of Hazard, right. and maybe most of all, WWF. Yeah. Right. So you got to be uh, fluent in all these things because these, these are the things that matter to you. Uh, and so that was always a big topic of discussion on the playground. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I wasn't able to participate in any way in any of these discussions because we didn't have pop culture uh, in my house. <laughs> we had a, uh, a wholesome house. OK, so I had no idea about any of this stuff. I wasn't really allowed to interact with it. And I didn't have uh, an older brother or sister who might sneak me bits and pieces of it. So when we were out on the playground, uh, I really had no idea what anybody was talking about. I just had to stand there and kind of observe. And 
you know, when you are a quiet observer, people will fill in that blank with their own ideas about what's going on in your head and what your intentions are. So that was a big topic uh, uh, of discussion on the playground. But then there was another there was another segment in the elementary school, and that was people who, for one reason or another, like me, couldn't participate in this discussion. Well, one of the convenient things for me was that there were a lot of ESL students on the playground who couldn't speak English particularly well. So they were also not talking about WWF. Uh, and those were the only, kind of the only people I could hang out with because uh, the, you know, the, the hometown guys thought I was uh, just a weirdo. Um, so because they were literally unable to have a conversation or maybe they had it in uh, some Chinese dialect, whatever else, uh, they would hang out separately and they would, uh, to the extent that they could talk about the things that they could talk about. And that was Kung Fu movies. So Bruce Lee, of course, right? Yeah. Uh, but also Jackie Chan and some deeper cuts like uh, Five Deadly Venoms, yeah. like uh, 36 yeah. Chambers of Shaolin. Yeah. Uh, yeah. My personal favorite, Chinese Super Ninjas. All right. So these are the, the real classics of 80s cinema and 70s cinema. Uh, now, truth be told, I wasn't allowed to access these either, but because I had uh, a friend who would sometimes sneak me a VHS, I could just get a little bit of a peek uh, into this world and I could interact in some minimal basis with this group of kids. So they became my friends, I became uh, their friend. And like I said, we kind of had two affinity groups separate out on the playground and they kind of hung out with each other. And, you know, as will happen, one group decides that they're the dominant group and the other one needs to submit to them. Well, uh, and I'm, I'm not trying to turn this into uh, any type of uh, race issue, but I'm just gonna speak frankly, you know, the kids who were in their own neighborhood who were mostly white had decided that they were superior to everybody else. And I kind of got pushed into the other group for a variety of reasons, including that I'm just mixed race, all right? So, that was no big deal. This was the 80s. This type of thing just simply happened, right? There was always this kind of uh, uh, background um, prejudice that everybody just kind of considered normal. Uh, it wasn't even worth remarking on. But there was this, uh, this event that occurred halfway through the year. A new kid came into the school. And like I said, this playground was kind of operating like prison rules. You got to join your gang and then you got to stay with your gang because if you don't have a gang, then nobody has your back. That's just kind of how it how it went. Maybe you're familiar with this. Yeah, oh yeah, I was there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but when someone new comes in, the entire uh, environment comes a little bit uh, destabilized. So this new guy came in and he needed to figure out uh, which gang he was going to join. <clears throat> and uh, of course he wanted to be in the uh the the important gang not with the kung fu guys all right uh, understandable but in order to get in to the the dominant gang you got to show that you're better than the other guys prison rules playground rules all the same and so somehow this guy figured out that i was the mark and i was going to be the one who got him entry uh, with the cool kids. <laughs> and so uh, this is what happened. You know, I I came from a, a, a poor family and we didn't have a lot of stuff. But one thing I did have that I was quite proud of was a, a Casio calculator watch. All right, the one with, you know, 20 buttons on it. Yeah. Not particularly practical, but it's a real prestige item. All right, when you're in the second grade. And so uh, this kid came up to me and said, hey, uh, nice watch, let me see it. And I said, oh, here it is, yeah, pretty cool, huh? He's like, no, 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 let me see it. You know, and he made it clear to me that let me see it means give it to me because it's mine and I'm, I'm bigger than you. Uh, and I, I, <laughs> I was not having this at all. I just, no, you can't see it, this is mine. I, and so he just shoved me right down on the ground and said, now, now give me your watch. <clears throat> So I got up and kicked the hell out of him. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, and I ended that fight real quick because I already knew, you know, just from observing how things go on this playground, it's got to go one way or the other. All right. Yeah. So everybody in both gangs saw this event. The fight started and the fight ended real quick. And uh, after that, uh, everybody in the Kung Fu gang started calling me Dilo. All right. So now I'm Dilo of the Kung Fu gang. <clears throat> and um, that's kind of how it all started. Uh, I was inadvertently kicked out of uh, of WWF culture and just by circumstance welcomed into Kung Fu culture. It's a good move. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think uh, it it couldn't have gone any better than it did. Um, <clears throat> but moving on from that, you know, I went on through uh, through uh, middle school and through high school, and you know the interest that I had in Kung Fu just kind of continued to very slowly grow in the background. I was so impressed by what I was seeing uh, on these videotapes and then sometimes, you know, on Black Belt Theater, Drive-In Movie, the, the, the places where you could see it at the time. These guys, you know, it wasn't the fighting that interested me. It was the fact that they had... I, you know, I didn't know how to put it into words at the time, but they had they had established some degree of freedom. That they could do what they wanted to do, uh, and if it if it needed to be fighting, then they could do that. But just going beyond that, you know, uh, they they could write their own ticket in a manner of speaking. And I was just I was so impressed with that. And one of the reasons I, I liked it is because I, I didn't know what it was that I wanted to do with my life, but I know that I wanted to do something challenging and that I would need to be equipped uh, in order to do it, whatever it was going to be. So I continued uh, watching those movies when I could, uh, which still wasn't very often, but, you know, a little bit more often than when I was in elementary school. <clears throat> All right, so fast forward a little bit to high school. And uh, now the shoe is on the other foot. Now I'm being bused across the city to uh, somebody else's school. And I'm in some sense the outsider. Um, and I'm still uh, not really enjoying it. Um, school was not a great experience for me, even though I had a lot of friends there. But it felt very much like uh, a waste of my time, to be honest. I mean, I know a lot of people feel that way, but including me. And uh, I was never one for completing worksheets. Uh, I felt like it was a waste of my time. I wanted to, to do something new, do something meaningful that hadn't already been done. And worksheets just couldn't cut it. <laughs> and I was really frustrated uh, with some of my classmates who seem to be competing to do worksheets better than the next guy. I just couldn't relate to that whatsoever. <clears throat> so I, I just paid less and less attention to that. And I, I changed the focus my, of my attention onto these Kung Fu movies. And I kind of made a challenge for myself to see how many days and how many classes I could skip and still pass. Uh, because I felt that uh, I didn't need to show anybody how smart I was. Like, I can do that anytime I want. I don't need you to tell me. I'll tell you, right? <clears throat> so I would skip uh, a day of class every week. Uh, not only because I wasn't loving the class, but also because you got to get up 45 minutes early to take the bus to the other side of town. And, you know, it was just it was just horrible. So... Um, I would skip a day every week and it worked, worked out fine. I still got an A minus. Okay. Well, maybe I can skip two days a week, every week. Uh, B plus, no problem. B plus is a pass. Maybe I can skip three days a week. So I started skipping two and three days every single week. And at this point, the uh, school administrators got pretty upset with me. Um, because I had demonstrated that attending class wasn't necessary. Yeah. All right, this is bad. This is bad for everybody but me. Right. <laughs> right. You know what I'm saying? 
Yeah. Uh, so, so I got called in. <clears throat> I got called in, and uh, the uh, guidance counselor said, "Well, why don't you just go to college instead? You know, you don't want to be here. Uh, we don't really want you here, so you just go to college instead." Now we have a wonderful program in Washington State called Running Start, where you can leave call, leave high school two years early, just go to college instead. You get a diploma and an associate degree at the same time. So this this worked out again inadvertently, perfectly for me. How does this? How does any of this relate to martial arts? We're going to come back to that a, a moment later. So I go to college instead of high school. Now I have a little bit more free time because uh, college classes are just you know better than high school classes. It's more respect for the students and. You know, I'm spending this extra time that I have watching Kung Fu movies, to be honest. Uh, <clears throat> every weekend, uh, I'm going down to Scarecrow Video, which is uh, the largest collection of foreign movies in the United States, and it's just right by my house. So every weekend, I would go down there, I'd get two or three Kung Fu movies, watch those. When I was done with those, maybe I'd do something. All right, it's a it's a win-win. Uh, I can I can survive like this indefinitely, I feel. And I'm passing my classes still. It's all it's all just fine uh, until I get to the final quarter of senior year. <laughs> and I get uh, a terminal case of senioritis, even for me, uh, for someone who's skipping three days a week is normal. Now I'm really testing the limit to see how much I can skip. Uh, the final requirement in Washington State is health class. Everybody knows it's an ECA, so I'm not worried in the slightest. I should have been worried. I should have been worried because when I got to the final week, I found out that I was not going to pass this class. Not passing this requirement means you do not graduate from high school. Not graduating from high school, school means that the uh, academic scholarship, which I had already worked out, is no longer available. So now it really seems like I have destroyed my future just by being careless uh, and, and by watching too many Kung Fu movies, to be honest. <clears throat> so I have no choice. I have to go to my professor and beg for some way out of this situation that I had created for myself. And so I'm in the professor's office She's quite upset with me, as she should be, but also hurt in a way that I had not anticipated at all because I was used to thinking about my teachers as people who were frankly just taking advantage of the system and using me to do it. But it wasn't that way at all. And now I really came to understand that my teacher was trying to help me in the way that she could and that I was just kind of uh, spitting in her face. And it was a really difficult and painful conversation where I had to come to understand uh, that that <laughs> education was not what I thought it was. Maybe it's not perfect, but people are generally just doing their best, right? And so I'm sitting in her office trying to beg without begging to graduate from high school and trying to insinuate that I'm interested in health, even though we both know that I have zero interest in health. Why would a teenager care about health? Uh, and so finally, the, this conversation reaches an apex and she just kind of cries and screams at me, well, what the hell do you care about? Answer me right now. And I said, well, uh, I'm kind of interested in martial arts. And man, the look of disappointment on <laughs> her face <laughs> when I said that. <laughs> but what could I do? I was entirely at her mercy at this point. And she, she really helped me out. She said, look, I'll let you write me a term paper about martial arts. And if it's good enough, I'll give you a D. And then you can move on with your life. But don't you dare come in here with a paper about punch, punching and kicking. I don't care about that. We don't need that. I already seen that. That's meaningless. I'm like, yeah, okay, that's fair. So I have two weeks 
before the grades are due in to write a term paper on a subject that I know nothing about, except for having watched, you know, a lot of movies, right? <clears throat> Is the story making sense so far? Yeah, I'm with you, 100%. Okay, great. So I head off to the Seattle Public Library. I check out every single book they have about martial arts. You're only allowed to take 20 books at one time, then they shut you down. So I took 20 books, read them all in a week, went back and got 20 more. I read every book they had. Uh, and I was trying to find some angle on martial arts that would not further inflame my health professor and that would somehow allow her to see me as a D student rather than an F student. And so I chose was, you know, how to understand martial art as a self improvement tool. Physical health is an element of it. Uh, we could say that psychological and social health are also elements of this. And I just, I, I tried to make the case as convincingly as I could, because this was the story that would either allow me to go to college or put me God knows where, maybe on the street even. Well, I got a D. <laughs> the paper was good enough. It was good enough, thank God. And, you know, having put everything I had into that paper, I was convinced, you know, the story I told was a true story. Yeah. Martial arts really is for this. It's not about punching and kicking. Who cares about punching and kicking? So having written that paper, I had no choice but to take it seriously and go and find someone who would teach me. Well, having read everybody's story, all the founders of martial arts and, you know, their followers, et cetera, et cetera, what are all these different arts about? Which one is the most compelling to me? There were two arts that really stood out as uh, noteworthy. <clears throat> the first one I would say was Aikido. And the reason for that is because I felt like the story they were telling made absolute sense to me. They were, they were trying to find a way to perform martial arts in a modern way, in an ethical way. And you take a, an unfortunate situation where a physical conflict is present and you just try not to make it worse. You know, you just try to bring it to as peaceful an end as is achievable under the circumstances. And you do that by turning other people's force against them. And you do that by understanding yourself and by having good posture and by always moving, you know, all that, all that beautiful stuff. Right. I really like that story. Yeah. I still like the story. <laughs> and then there's the second art. All right. And this is Tai Chi Chuan. This story makes no sense. It makes no sense whatsoever. You're telling me that uh, some old Chinese guy watched a snake and a crane and he was an immortal and then he traveled around. And when people tried to hit him, they hurt their hands. And when they tried to throw him on the ground, they fell down and he touched them and they bounced away. And this guy had more energy and he understands the universe and yin and yang, blah, blah, blah. This story is total nonsense. I can't even understand why anybody would write this down. And, you know, I read two or three books about Tai Chi. They didn't even line up. They couldn't even tell the same story. Uh, and this was interesting because it was very confusing. I mean, it was total nonsense, but it made me really wonder what is going on here. Somebody was convinced enough to write this in a book and publish it and stick it in the library. What am I missing? So now I've graduated from high school and I've got a little bit of free time uh, in between you know, on my summer break before I have to go there. And so fortunately for me, there is a Tai Chi school and an Aikido school within uh, a reasonable distance from my house. So I get to actually go and check what these things actually are in practice. Never mind what the book says, I get to find out for myself. First, I visit the, the Aikido school. 
And uh, I am very happy to find out it's exactly what it said it was. I walk in there, people are very polite, uh, very friendly. Uh, it looks like they're doing something real, you know? You've got a real attack coming in, whatever. Maybe it's some abstract sword attack. Maybe it's a punch, something else. And this guy ends up on the ground and he he does it in a very uh, uh, convincing way, right? So I'm really happy with what I'm seeing there. But I need to go check out the Tai Chi school as well. All right, so the next the next evening, I go over to the Tai Chi school. So I walk in, it's pretty quiet. Uh, I, I meet the instructor and I say, hey, you know, I'd love to watch this class if you'll allow me. She says, sure, have a seat. Uh, and they do, I don't know, maybe 15 minutes of warm up exercises in total silence. And it doesn't look like they're doing much. They're just kind of wobbling around, as far as I can tell. You know, when I was at the Aikido school, they're doing things that I know I can't do. They're doing something. If I try to do this, there's no chance. What these Tai Chi guys are doing, I could do it right now if I wanted to. So what is this? <clears throat> so I sit there in silence, respectfully, just watching, just observing quietly. It's a little bit uncomfortable because nobody's saying anything. And, you know, the, the Aikido school was a little bit louder. People were a little bit more boisterous. Here, it's like the library, actually. I don't understand what's happening, but I just sit and keep watching because it's an hour class and I'm going to stay for an hour and figure out what it is that I'm missing, right? 20 minutes later, <laughs> the teacher walks back over to me. This is the slow one. She says, yes, yes, thank you. Thank you, I can see that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the I get the impression that I'm welcome, but I'm not really. Uh, you're kind of, you're messing up the vibe. You're messing up our silent class by sitting here silently. But I stay there anyway, because look, I gotta know what's happening here. So it goes on for another 40 minutes, more or less, the same way as it did for the preceding 20. Uh, people are just kind of moving around slowly. It has no meaning so far as I can tell. They're kind of copying each other, but kind of not. And at the end, nothing happened. It was an hour of nothing culminating in nothing. So I said, thank you very much. Uh, I'll think about it and I'll come back. And that was the end. Tai Chi sucks. All right, this is actually what they wrote in the book. It's nonsense. I'm not doing this. I'm never going to do this. I go back to the Aikido school. And I enroll there, and I'm very happy there. Um, it's a great challenge for me because I'm somebody who has, you know, zero physical talent. I can't do anything that they are doing. And I'm very happy about that because this is a school. Uh, I understand they're here to help me. I'm here to be, be empowered to do something that I cannot already do. So this is, I'm, I'm as happy as a clam. This is the kind of education that I was always looking for. This is not checklists and worksheets. This is someone trying to hit me in the face and you better stop them because if you don't stop them, they succeed. So that's wonderful. And I continue uh, doing Aikido as I move into college. This works out really nice for me because when I get into college, I do find something uh, that I like doing and that I'm good at and doesn't require a lot of my attention. I, I become uh, an engineer. And this is the, the one thing that I do seem to have a natural talent for. So I don't need to work too hard on it. I can direct all of my focus uh, on martial arts, really. All right. Perfect solution. I need to switch Aikido schools because my college is further away and I can't get to the original one, but that's all right. Uh, new school, new approach. And I continue on doing that for hours a week for years. <clears throat> and so now um, <laughs> I need to move to a new Aikido school, which is uh, in Seattle's Chinatown. And 
It's a real grassroots operation. It's not a martial arts school at all. It's a it's the basement of an office office building. And they just rented an office and put down one extra layer of carpet. There aren't even any mats. There's just an extra carpet. It's not even real carpet. It's office carpet, which, as you know, is horrible, right? It's just the cheapest garbage you can put. So <laughs> it's a real trial by fire because every time you fall down, you either fall down perfectly or you've just been injured, to be honest, right? So I continue going there. Uh, I'm real happy there. I'm pretty happy uh, at college, but it's just kind of something that I'm doing in between martial arts classes. Uh, but unfortunately, this uh, school has to close down at some point. We won't get into the reasons why, although they're very interesting, but I'll, I'll save it for other some other time because <laughs> we're, we're barely even on chapter two of this story and it's a long story, right? Uh, is this still interesting? I don't know. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, please take your time. Okay, great. So, um, you know, it's a hard conversation I have with the sensei there because I, I feel like we're all birds of a feather there. You know, we're all working on the same thing, similar things for similar reasons. And he, I understand him and he understands me. And that's not something that I've always experienced in education outside of uh, martial arts. So, you know, he, he goes into some of the reasons why the school has to close. I'm very sorry. I don't mean to be leaving you out like this, but sometimes this just happens. In fact, it happened to the last guy who was in our space. It happened to Master Yang as well. So, you know, this is just something that happens in martial arts. And Master Yang, never heard of this guy. He says, oh, well, you know, he was a Tai Chi guy. Like, oh God, <laughs> Tai Chi again? I don't need to hear any more about it. Um, so I leave that Aikido school. I'm looking around now because look, I can't not learn more martial arts. This is so fascinating. And I can really start to experience for myself how the stories that I wrote in that term paper are absolutely true. Like this has been good for me psychologically it's obviously begun for me uh, physically because it's a it's a pretty good workout if you go at it with intensity and you know i just feel better because i'm doing something that matters i still really can't put my finger on all of the reasons why it does but it's clear that it does this is something that i should be doing maybe it's not my life calling probably isn't how could it be uh my own teacher couldn't keep a school open. So that's not a great advertisement for making this your career. Uh, and I don't need to because, uh, you know, engineering is a, is a lucrative field. So I've got that set. But uh, I have to keep doing this somewhere. So now I'm looking around. I'm looking more broadly uh, for other martial arts that might interest me. <clears throat> and I just happened to notice that they are teaching uh, Kung Fu in the college gym. They're teaching Wing Chun. And I've done enough research already now to know that uh, Wing Chun was Bruce Lee's original style. Yeah. You know, uh, Bruce Lee is a Seattle hero. Right. Bruce Lee and I grew up in the same neighborhood. I literally walked up and down the same streets that he had walked in order to get to my Aikido school. So this is great. Uh, I'm really excited to learn this. And so I head in to the, to the college gym you know, say hello, I'd love to enroll. He's like, great, you're, you're welcome here. And in fact, you can try out your stuff on me. <laughs> so at this point, I think I've got maybe two-ish years of Aikido under my belt. You know, it's not a lot, but it's a lot more than none. And I'm streets away from where I was when I started. I'm very comfortable falling down in all different directions. I know a lot of techniques to uh, counter a lot of attacks. Because I was really working hard on this. This was my real job. College was just for fun. Right. Uh, I'm not in martial arts class, right? <clears throat> so I tried my stuff. It was all worthless. I couldn't do anything against this guy. And he was not even trying. <clears throat> Everything I tried, he just immediately countered it and just, you know, put his fist on my chest or on my chin or on my nose and just kind of like, yeah, okay, that's great. Try again. Uh, and this was fantastic. 
<clears throat> this is fantastic. You know, this is the, again, this is the type of education I really wanted because uh, it's something real. Uh, I don't know how important it is in the broader scheme of things. I'm still finding that out. But one thing I know is it's undeniable. Like you can't, you can't argue about whether or not this actually happened or not, which is, you know, something I had been doing in a lot of academic classes, let's say. They were telling me things I knew weren't true. And I would just say, look, no, this isn't, this isn't how it is. And you know, that's always a mess. You don't want to do that. Um, but the martial arts is real. So I enrolled in this Kung Fu school, you know, starting over from square one, who cares? This is something real. And I was having a blast doing that as well. Uh, eventually I found another Aikido school that I could enroll in because even though it didn't work against these guys, it still seemed pretty good, you know, and they still told a good story that I still believed in. Never mind that it didn't work against Wing Chun. I don't care. So now I'm doing both of them. I'm doing this six to seven days a week, you know, two to three hours a day, as much as I possibly can, uh, well, still passing my classes, which I now understand is an important thing that you have to put a little bit of attention on at least, right? <clears throat> and um, I keep doing this until I reach a point where my Wing Chun is good enough that everybody else's Aikido is kind of worthless against me. Uh, I don't mean to say that in any type of conceited way. It's just the reality of the situation because in my Wing Chun school, we practiced very hard and we did a lot of sparring and uh, it doesn't need to be high intensity, but it was completely unchoreographed. You can do anything you want. Right. And we would just explore right. what is an appropriate response to those situations. Whereas I'm sure, you know, Aikido is fairly rigorously prescribed yeah. and uh, even when, you know, open-minded Americans are doing it, the minute you actually go off script, uh, people freak out. People freak out. I, I, I did it a few times and it was not well received. Uh, but, you know, sometimes they would have open mats and there was a little bit of space in order to try your stuff. And when I did that, nobody had any answer for it. It was the same situation that I had been in earlier when I first walked into Wing Chun. So now Aikido doesn't work anymore against me. The, the, the students can't do it, the teachers can't do it. And, you know, I went to seminars with some of the highest level Aikido masters coming over from uh, Japan, Europe, etc. Uh, and I saw what they were doing and it also didn't work against me. <clears throat> that doesn't mean it's not valuable, of course, but that was just my personal uh, experience. And, you know, since since it no longer worked against me, I kind of lost interest in continuing to practice it. And I must say that my my Wing Chun teacher was a little bit proud of that as well. You know, because these were people who had spent 20, 40, even 60 years working on their practice. And after three or four years of Kung Fu, I was just shutting them down. They were not happy at all about it, but you know, uh, this is education. You got to distinguish between true and false. It's not just different opinions. So <clears throat> I kept doing my Wing Chun and I dropped my Aikido. Well, now I have some free time. So what am I going to do with that? Am I going to do schoolwork? <laughs> no, I'm going to go find more martial arts that I can do. Uh, so now, you know, I have a broader perspective and I'm looking at other things that I can do on the days when I'm not in Kung Fu class. So I found that um, there's some people doing Xingyi in the park. Maybe I can try some Xingyi. That sounds kind of fun. Uh, this and that, some other things as well. And some people do a Maruajan. Maybe I'll give it a try. And I did give it a try. And I spent, you know, a couple of months each in a variety of other things, <clears throat> which I really enjoyed and helped me appreciate, you know, Wing Chun in a new way. Because if you're always working out with people who know all the same tricks you know, and they have more or less the same strengths and the same weaknesses, uh, it can become a little bit stagnant. 
still benefits, but it can become a little bit stagnant. So now I had a whole nother bag of tricks that my classmates uh, didn't have. And now kind of the shoe was on the other foot. You know what I mean? So I could come in, I can enter on them with a Xing Yi technique and they didn't have a good answer for it. And I'd switch to Aikido because actually turns out if you have a strong foundation, you can use Aikido uh, unrehearsed. Without it, you can't. But if you have a strong foundation, frankly, in things that aren't Aikido, then you can make it work at full speed and power. So that was my discovery. And uh, I was really having a blast because, you know, I felt like this is my opportunity to share with my classmates and my teacher also as well, So who had so generously shared with me years earlier. So now I get to make a contribution and help everybody improve, uh, which is after all what we're all here for, right? <clears throat> well, that was how I saw it. It wasn't quite how my teacher saw it. Uh, he found it uh, a little bit disruptive that I was mixing in uh, random Shin moves or Bagua moves or Aikido moves into uh, the Wing Chun curriculum. I, I must say he had trouble dealing with it as well. And I think if he could have shut it down easily, then he wouldn't have had a problem with it. But it just ended up creating a little bit of uh, friction because he wanted to, now he wanted to stick with the Wing Chun curriculum, very orthodox, and he didn't like my uh, insertion of confusion uh, into the class, which was never my intention at all. You know, I only had the highest respect and desire to, to give back in the same way that they had shared with me. But uh, it became, it became problematic. Uh, there was some confusion about who really knew what they were doing. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it became time for me to leave, uh, even though I didn't really want to leave. And even though I wasn't explicitly told to leave, it was just time. It yeah. was just time. And now I didn't really know what to do because I had gone around and visited many, if not most, of the martial arts teachers in the Seattle area. And, you know, they all had their virtues, but they couldn't, they could no longer take me to school. I would take them to school. So I can't join your class and take you to school. I had just found out what happens if you try to do that. Yeah. So now I was in a really awkward situation where I felt like there's decades more material for me to learn. There must be but nobody around here has it to share. And so I thought back to what my Aikido teacher had told me about uh, Master Yang. Master Yang. Well, I haven't met him. He's maybe the one guy I haven't met. Who is this guy? So I looked into it. Oh, Master Yang is maybe the most famous Tai Chi teacher in the world at this time. And he has come to Seattle. He came to me. I didn't even have to go to him. He came to me and opened up a school. Well, I think maybe now I should go and take another look at this Tai Chi that people have been talking about. Still doesn't make any sense, but I'm willing to give it another look uh, from my new perspective. Because now I know enough about how these things generally work that I don't have to rely on somebody else's opinion that I read in a book. I can I can make an analysis and now I can be satisfied that I know what's going on. Either it works and it works or it doesn't work and it doesn't work and that's that. So I can close the book on this one way or another. Either I'm going to learn Tai Chi for the right reasons or I'm going to throw it out forever for the right reasons and find something else to do. So I go and visit uh, Master Yang and I'm pleasantly surprised uh, at what I see. Uh, it's a really professionally run school in the way that frankly, most of the other ones were not, you know, martial arts schools tend to be run by passionate hobbyists 
Yeah. Uh, and there's a there's a pro and a con to that. Yeah. Um, but but Master Yang was very professional and he was very deliberate in what he was doing. And so I decided that, you know, whether or not I still had no idea what he was doing in the class or why it mattered or how it related to martial arts or how it related to the stories that I had read now years ago about people bouncing off you, about people injuring themselves when they try to attack you. It's still these stories didn't make any sense. Um, but I was willing to invest some time and find out because honestly, what else am I going to do? I've kind of ran through all the other options now at this point. I either got to leave town or I got to open up my own school or, or I'm just going to have to uh, bite the bullet and see what there is to be learned here. So I studied Tai Chi uh, directly with uh, Master Yang week in and week out for a couple of years. And that was, yeah. you know, a rare privilege uh, for me. But, you know, after a few years, I kind of, I didn't feel like the most important questions that I had uh, were answered. Uh, after two or three years, I still didn't see anybody bouncing off anybody else. Uh, I didn't see any uh, magical powers. And I frankly didn't really see any relationship between practicing the Tai Chi form and practical martial art. And now I'm looking at it through the benefit of having done the form exactly as I was told hundreds or thousands of times. I've done everything he asked me to do as with as much fidelity as I could, because I have to know. I'm, this is the expert. I'm going to listen to the expert. And so I did that to the best of my ability, but I, it just it still didn't make any sense to me. <clears throat> And I should mention one more thing that I kind of skipped over. Actually, I went to Shaolin Temple and studied uh, intensive Nagum. <laughs> so this is, oh, yeah, uh, yeah uh, important little detail here. Uh, so I had a lot of practical experience with skills that Tai Chi people can only talk about or dream about. Like, I went very deep into this. Um, and so, you know, if somebody just told me, well, if you do the form a lot, you'll have more chi. I'm like, hey, be specific. I already know all this stuff. You be specific. Uh, and they, they never could, to be honest. So even though I had the highest respect for Master Young and for his uh, students, whom I enjoyed spending time with, it, you know, it just really, it wasn't for me. It wasn't going anywhere that I wanted to go. I had done the form thousands of times. It still looked more or less the same as it had when I started, you know, because I had enough background that I could make the shapes and execute the movements uh, in the way that he did. And I, I just didn't see the point. I'd rather be doing uh, Nagel more directly if if that's the goal. So now I've really exhausted all the options and there is nothing for me to do. What am I supposed to do now? So at that point, I founded the Seattle Martial Arts Club. And uh, I told everybody, because now at this point in history, you know, the internet's existed for a while, but now we're starting to have enthusiast communities really spin up, including martial arts. So there's a there's uh, people who are serious will find each other online, which hadn't been obviously the case when I started years before. So I started the Seattle Martial Arts Club. I said, hey, come on out. We'll do some light sparring. We'll follow patterns. We'll do drills, whatever interests you. Our only goal is that, you know, we help each other to get better. That's it. Uh, there's no cost. We'll do it outside. And you can bring your Tai Chi, you can bring your Wing Chun, you can bring your Kung Fu, Karate, you can bring your kickboxing, whatever else. And, you know, let's just give it a try. And a lot of people did, and that was a, a wonderful uh, experience. <clears throat> uh, we did a lot of cross training, <laughs> or, or as I understood it, just training. Because I never had the idea that 
uh, this is supposed to be a style used against the same style or whatever. And um, that this was the goal. I never, I never saw it in those terms. I, I, I was now a professional engineer and I'm interested in real solutions to real problems. So that was great. You know, we met up once or twice a, a week outside for years and all kinds of people came through. I dare say most of the serious people in Seattle who weren't totally dedicated to staying within their school uh, came to join us. Including some Tai Chi people who did not fare well, <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah, it was clear that they didn't have any better understanding of Tai Chi than I did, even though they were all convinced, you know, that they, they had read these stories in the books and they hadn't asked as many difficult questions as I had asked about them. They hadn't demanded that these stories be reconciled with each other and with uh, the evidence that is in front of us in terms of, look, this is me punching you in the jaw. What are you going to do about it? You can't talk to me about the five elements. You have to do something right now, right? And right behind this one, here comes another one. So that's just reality. And um, <laughs> so my my opinion of Tai Chi, you know, was, was falling ever lower uh, over time. I just had zero interest in it. But because I was now connected to both the online and offline martial arts communities in Seattle and now around the world, uh, I was uh, becoming aware of other Tai Chi masters who were offering, you know, to teach seminars uh, and workshops. And so I still availed myself of some of those opportunities. And um, at some point, <laughs> I finally found the version of Tai Chi that had been written about in the stories. At long last, now it's been, uh, at this point, probably 15 years in the story, 15 years in. I've been searching more or less continuously for an explanation for Tai Chi that could hold up to any scrutiny whatsoever. Finally, finally, I find one. All I have to do is drive to Canada. All right, so I, I go down there, I go up there, uh, rather. And, uh, you know, I meet a, a well-respected uh, Tai Chi master. This was Fong Ha. Yeah. Rest in peace, Fong Ha. And he says, look, you can you can do what you want. You just come try. <laughs> he, he let me do it because I was the biggest guy in the class, I think, to be honest. And he wanted to put on a bit of a show. So, look, I know what these Tai Chi's Kaiji guys love. They love to just kind of push on each other. They don't love to get socked in the jaw. So I just put that off the table. It doesn't matter. He can't take my push. I don't need to hit him. He can't take my push. Just some old guy. So I push him. Oh, this is strange. I push him and nothing happened. Nothing happened. So I double the power. Still, nothing happened. This is not like any Tai Chi I have, have experienced before, and I went all around to try to find it all. All right, now I give him 100%. I, I'm not trying to be rude, but, you know, we got to find out. All right, he's going to move when I give 100%, but maybe he'll do some rollback or something. Now he'll try to sneak in and attack, whatever. That's what these guys do. He did nothing. I gave him all of my force, and he just stood there like I didn't exist. And then he just moved in and threw me away. What? This is Tai Chi? He didn't do anything. This is what I had been looking for all along. Oh, this is magical. I had seen things done like this in Kung Fu. I had seen real high-level Kung Fu. Guys who could do things like this, but never so subtle and understated and confusing. That was the real thing. I was now, you know, instructor grade in multiple martial arts, and I had no idea what had just happened to me. This was really something special. Now I kind of want to learn Tai Chi, but it doesn't make any sense because I had spent years learning Tai Chi. I couldn't do this. Nobody I had trained with 
could do this. People who had spent you know years longer than I had in it. I had met people in the community, spent decades doing it. They couldn't do any of this. How can this be Tai Chi? How can this be Tai Chi? So now all the questions that I thought had been put to rest, now they've only been amplified. Now it makes even less sense than it ever did. Now I'm really starting to get interested in Tai Chi again, okay? After I meet Fang Ha, I don't understand how this happens, but I get invited to meet other people who are also legit. Next guy I go meet to is Sam Tam. Okay. Sam Tam's also the real deal. He can do, he can do uh, some really interesting stuff. Some great stuff. Uh, some of it's been put on YouTube and nobody believes it. I totally understand. It looks completely fake. And the other things which he asked me not to put on the internet, so I haven't, but you really won't believe it. You won't even believe what you have seen. You for sure can't believe what uh, he's holding back and what some other people are holding back. It's really incredible. Uh, he said, don't talk about it, so I won't talk about it. Um, but now, now I really want to learn Tai Chi. Now I want to learn Tai Chi. There's only one problem. Uh, Sam is in Vancouver. Fong Ha is in the Midwest at this time. And I'm in Seattle. And I have a full-time job. And, you know, <clears throat> I'm well aware of, let's say, the limitations of offline remote learning. If I have to do it, I will do it. I'll fly out there every three months and I'll just get what I can and come back home and, and practice. But, you know... As, as thrilled as I am with what I've discovered, I'm also a bit uh, disillusioned because this whole thing, it, it makes less sense than it ever did. These guys seem to be doing the same things that I was seeing 15 years ago, but the results are absolutely different. There's no relationship in the outcome. So I must be missing something, but, but what am I missing? Um, they talk a little bit about it, but you know, Kung Fu culture is the culture of face. You can't be too direct. That's right. so, all. Even if you can be direct, you're not gonna be direct with some guy you just met. Some guy who's asking a lot of dangerous questions. The answers to these questions are going to embarrass somebody. It may injure somebody's career. Well, then th the answers are not for you. You come back, ask me in a year, maybe two years, maybe I'll give you half the answer. That's how this culture works, right? For better and worse. It's always been that way. Right. Um, but now <laughs> I, I really got to know. I really got to know. Now I know Tai Chi is real. All these stories that were written in the books, now I understand. The people who wrote it down had no idea. The things are real. The people teaching them generally can't do it. They're just reciting a story that they heard. It's got no relationship to their practice, but it does have a relationship to the real Tai Chi twin. Great. I've got to know more about this. Well, it just so happens, again, another guy comes to Seattle. Fu Zhong Wan's assistant instructor. Now, for, for uh, viewers who may not know, Yong Chung Fu is the fellow that made Tai Chi famous in the early 20th century. That's my story, all right? People can disagree, it's fine. Put it in the comments. That's my story. Yong Chung Fu made it famous. And um, Yong Chung Fu had a, a number of major and minor disciples People say that the fellow whose practice most closely resembled Yang Cheng Fu was named Fu Zhong Wan. Fu Zhong Wan was very proud of not having changed anything uh, in the practice or the curriculum, insofar as he was able. Right? Uh, it's it's normal and perhaps appropriate for people to make tweaks to the curriculum to suit their temperament and their body styles. That's a, that's a reasonable thing to do. But he said, no, 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 I haven't changed anything. 
and you know other disciples of uh, Yong Cheng Fu uh, were willing to co-sign on that. So it's really an important thing to know because you know there's no film of Yang Cheng Fu, there's no film of early Tai Chi Chuan. All we have is the performance to the extent it's been handed down within people. So uh, Fu Zheng Wan being an excellent example of what Tai Chi was when it was considered worthy of becoming famous. Fu Zheng Wan's assistant instructor moves to Seattle. He did it a long time ago, I never even knew. He moved to Seattle at the same time that I was first becoming interested in martial arts. Uh, but he really kept a low, prof a low profile, as so many of these guys will. You would hope that if they have something wonderful, they would be screaming it out as loud as they could so that you could hear it. But the truth is that uh, this stuff still trans it travels through a whisper network, even now. Even now, you kind of got to know somebody who knows somebody so that you can know somebody. It's crazy in the age of the internet that it would still be this way, but it is this way, at least in my experience, right? Absolutely. What, I mean, what do you think? Is that, is that oh, yeah, accurate? Absolutely, it's fair to say, yeah. Yeah, so I got to meet this guy, Xie Bing Tan, yeah. Fu Zheng Wan's assistant instructor. This guy had worked really hard to answer many of the questions that had been bedeviling me. <clears throat> and so I went to go meet him. <laughs> and he said, he said what a Kung Fu master will say. Oh yeah, you aren't, think you know something? Show me. So I start going through the form. Uh, I figure, you know, I'll go through two or three minutes. He's probably going to say what these guys say, which is, oh, some good, some bad. I do one movie, stop. Garbage. <laughs> no, stop. No good, no good. He didn't speak a lot of English, but he was he was very capable of making his opinion crystal clear. No good. You no good. Come over here. So he, he told me that I needed to stand in the corner, face away from everybody else, and just do chi shirt again and again and again. The opening movement of Tai Chi. Just raise your arms down. Uh, raise your arms up, put them back down. Again and again and again. I'm like, I got to know what this guy's doing, so I'm willing to do it. And, you know, after I do this for 15 minutes, maybe he'll quit acting like a jerk and come teach me something for real. So I'm standing, facing out the window, away from the class, just raising my arms up and down. Every five minutes, I peek over my shoulder, said, hey, stop. You go. <laughs> <laughs> teacher uh i did this for around two hours and finally i had had enough you know look you're going to teach me you're not going to teach me but i don't know what the hell it is i'm doing here and so then he allowed me to turn around and do it while i'm facing the class and at least get a sense of what's happening in the class <sighs> And, you know, that was, I would say, the start of my real Tai Chi education. Over the next nine years, I came to understand that he was right. I didn't know a single thing about Tai Chi. I didn't know what I was doing. Everything was wrong. <laughs> and everything he said was right. It was insane. How could I do Tai Chi for so long? and be missing so much. <clears throat> yeah, it, it was a, a hell of a learning experience. And, you know, I took what he taught me and I went out and uh, I became a, uh, now I'm gonna condense the story. It's already been an hour. I didn't even realize time, time flies. Mm -hmm. That's when you're, when you're talking about yourself. Uh, but, um, you know, I went out, I thought what he was doing was really good, but you know, you got to check these things, right? Of course, everybody thinks what they're doing is good as they should. If they, if they don't do something they think is good, they shouldn't be doing it. Uh, nevertheless, there are levels. And so I went out to go check and, you know, 
uh, the rest is history, as they say. So that's quite a, um, like an arc, you know, the, the fact that you, um, it, it's pretty normal, I think, when people go out, you know, looking to, to learn something and um, it takes them maybe some time to find the right art, but yeah. to find what you think is the right art and then find out that you actually knew nothing, yeah. which I, it, it does happen. It happened to me, you know, mm -hmm. but when that happens, a lot of, that finishes a lot of people off, you know, they're, yeah. they're, they're like, oh, I spent five years doing this and it wasn't even the real thing. And, <laughs> yeah. You know, you, you would think you would be happy that, that that your five years was over with or your nine years or however long it was. But a lot of people are just like, you know, I've wasted all this time. I'm not going to waste any more time. So, I mean, the fact that you stuck with it, um, you know, he, he must have uh, his instruction must have really made a mark on you. I mean, did it just give you a whole new level of energy when you found that the door was finally open and you were you were learning what you'd been looking for the entire time? Uh, you know, it was a progress of be, uh, a, a process of becoming more and more confused, not less confused. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it was probably only around year eight that there was any respite whatsoever of just being, you know, I, he would just continuously say everything was wrong. Uh, and in his in his way, he really tried hard to communicate what he wanted, which which was hard for him because he did speak some English, but his accent, his his Shanghainese accent was so thick that even when he was speaking English, he was still speaking Chinese. Yeah. And so if you were around him for a couple of years and you could decode it, if you spoke Chinese and you could decode it, but otherwise he just he he couldn't, he had to show you. He had to show you. And he had to use good no good, little less, little more. Just, you know, the phrases that you could pick up. This was frustrating for me. It was impossible for some of my classmates. Yeah. Uh, you know, this is Seattle. So um, we had a lot of engineers uh, come through from, uh, you know, uh, Microsoft uh, and elsewhere. And so it was nice to have people around me who thought in similar ways, but yeah, the way he transmitted information, as as frustrating it was for me, who had already gone through this process, you know, whatever three, four, five times, uh, for them it was nearly impossible. Yeah. If you're not used to that type of teaching, I know that he was um pretty well known for his uh qigong and twina too. Like, did did that play a part in your education too? Was he was that part of your your learning? <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, you're right. Uh, he was and. Anybody who goes deep into martial arts has to find some way to connect it to their uh, livelihood, right? Because if you can't do that, then it's just limiting the amount of time and energy you can put into it. So back when I was studying uh, Nagum in depth, you know, my teacher at the time uh, encouraged us to become... Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what is the right term. I want to use the right term here, but I don't know. Let's just say, let's just say uh, folk healers. Yeah. I don't want to say the wrong thing and get anybody in trouble. So let's just say folk healers. And, you know, that wasn't something that particularly interested me at the time. Um, but if, if, if you can't, find some way to dedicate 10 hours a day to it. That's just going to limit, you know, your progress. So that was the point that he was uh, making to us. And with uh, Shea, Matthew Shea, uh, he was indeed uh, an expert in medical massage. And because it's strongly related to, to Tai Chi Chuan, this was great for him. And so when we got a few years in, he basically offered us all the opportunity to learn Twena as well. <laughs> and uh, I knew what was going to happen if I started over with him again. So I kind of just told him, I'm pretty busy, but I'll keep learning Tai Chi. Uh, one of my one of my classmates, uh, Mark, said, yeah, I'll learn Twena. And, you know, he, he got put through the ringer all over again. So I said, no, thanks. This time I skipped it. Uh, just Tai Chi is enough for me for now. So at what point did you decide to start teaching what you've learned? 
Uh, well, I started doing that in, in 2016. And yeah, I started doing that in 2016. I just felt like I knew enough that I was ready to share it and ready to share it with people who were closer to home because, you know, I had to go uh, a half hour away to study with Shea, which in a half hour is nothing, and nothing in the grand scheme of things. But, you know, I know that, frankly, most people, if it's 15 minutes, they'll just say, I'll just choose the next teacher. I'll just go to the community center and yeah. learn from whoever's there instead. And um, that's, you know, that's fine. Anybody can learn from from whom they want, but I I felt like uh, there was something really special here that I wanted to share, uh, you know, just as he had shared with me. So that that was my uh, motivation to start teaching. There's more to it than that, but we'll, we'll save it for some other time. Okay. So you know, I mentioned at the beginning of the uh, the introduction about you know your competition. Mm -hmm. You've competed at a lot of events um, against a lot of you know different people. Um, you're you're pretty you're a pretty big guy, right? Like what? what you, how tall are you? Uh, I'm six foot and two fifteen. Okay, yeah. So was that that's like a heavyweight for push hands, right? Uh, yeah. Usually it's two oh five and above, okay. <laughs> which has been a, a really interesting challenge for me because. In any real combat sport, it's not allowed. You can't have 205 and above. You got 20 to 30 pound ranges. Okay. And so, you know, sometimes it's 205 versus 210. Sometimes okay. it's 205 versus uh, 285, which it actually, you know, was uh, for one of my uh, matches. Now, you know, I'm, I'm down for a challenge, but it, sure. it becomes, uh, honestly, it becomes dangerous and then people won't ensure your event. And that's why. One of the things that the Tai Chi community just needs to solve. Yeah. So is that, is that something that you've brought up at all, like with uh, event organizers or anything like that? Uh, I have. I have gently, you know, I I understand all the different pressures that are being exerted on them. And I'm frankly just very grateful that they can execute anything whatsoever in Chinese martial arts with the mess that it is compared to, you know, uh, Japanese martial arts, just for example, right? I, I, I visited uh, a judo competition a few months ago just as a spectator for fun, and it was absolutely executed to perfection in a way that I don't think has ever once been done in Chinese martial arts. It's crazy. But, you know, in order to make these events happen, uh, you need to welcome in a lot of kids, and then that changes the structure of the whole event. This is great. I'm I'm totally in favor of it, but you know it's hard to serve their interests uh, in an ideal way and also serve adults. And you know one of the additional challenges that we face in Neji Chuan is that everybody thinks they're too good for competition, yeah. right? Too deadly, yeah. They think they're too good for it, uh, and they're very eager to slander anybody who might dare to engage in it. Now, I, I noticed that I think sure. you had a uh, sort of like an open mat night at your school where you've invited, like, you know, other martial artists from other schools if they wanted to come and attend. Do you, ha do you have a pretty good turnout from other schools or other disciplines when you when you hold an event like that? Um. Well... The open mat is kind of a new thing. Um, I have high hopes for it, but it's it's so difficult to find Tai Chi people who are at any sort of level where they can even engage in that. Uh, it's almost impossible. So Uh, we end up having interactions with other styles of martial arts instead, which I'm 100% in favor of. They're absolutely welcome. I want them to keep coming. Uh, but I also want to advance the state of the art in Tai Chi so that uh, we can all be more comfortable interacting with each other. And so we've had some success with the open mat, but I guess I'll mention that we've had a lot more success uh, having these 
uh, large weekend events two or three times a year where we can invite Tai Chi people to do the things that they're comfortable doing, which is mostly forms and fixed step push-ins. And uh, we've had a tremendous uh, attendance for those. I've been doing those for around two or three years now in the Seattle area. And uh, I'll just like to mention that uh, some of my friends and colleagues are doing something similar on the East Coast with the Tampa Bay Martial Arts Group. And I, I highly encourage people to attend those events as well. Awesome. So you feel like you get, do you get a pretty um, positive or uh, energetic feedback from people maybe that have been doing Tai Chi for a while when they come to Shoreline and, and see the types of things that you're doing there? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, they, they tend to be shocked in the same way that I was shocked when I first met uh, Fang Ha. Yeah. Oh, it's like this, but I've been doing this for 10, 20, 30 years. Not, nobody has ever shown me this. Ah, I understand. I was in the same position. It's gotta be a so great it's my pleasure to share this. Yeah, absolutely. So what, what could people like, could you, maybe walk us through briefly what um, a beginning student to your school, um, what, what's the, what's the teaching environment like? What's the learning environment like? Sure. Sure. <clears throat> well, you know, uh, as, as professional Tai Chi instructors, somehow we need to bridge the gap between the art as it, let's say, as it was defined a hundred years ago, and let's just punt on what it means to say that it was defined 100 years ago. Let's just pretend that's the case. Uh, how do we bridge the gap between the art as it was and the people as they are now? So the people are different in a, in a number of ways. Uh, firstly, they have shorter attention spans. Uh, they have uh, greater distractions. Uh, they have less physical capability overall. And so one of the things that we have to confront when we're teaching new students is that even if intellectually they were fully capable of performing a posture, physically they cannot. Mm. It's physically impossible for them to do it. Because, for example, they can't enter the type of squat which is prescribed by the floor. And so... One of the challenges I face as an instructor is giving them progressions that uh, are moving them towards the ultimate goal while also allowing them to observe a level of progress that will satisfy them. Because it's hard, you know, you can, you can be learning something and feel that you're not or vice versa. And your feelings are what will allow you to continue or demand that you quit. Yeah. Good. So, so the way I run a beginner's class is typically uh, five or 10 minutes of warm ups, five or 10 minutes of drills, five or 10 minutes reviewing what we did last week, which half of the people have already forgotten. And then, you know, the remainder of the class dedicated to a combination of working through a short sequence from traditional forms and also just focusing on a single move so that <clears throat> people can walk out at the end of an hour capable of saying at least there's one concrete thing that I know that I learned and that I did learn. Because, you know, you can perform the form in the old style and get something meaningful from it and not even know that that has happened. And I think that's, well, I know that is the way it was generally taught in the past. And the, the masters that we have alive today generally went through that process. But today's uh, students have a real hard time with that. Yeah. You know, one, one of the questions I like to ask everybody, um, we're, we're just about out of time, but, um, you know, you mentioned earlier um, about, you know, when Tai Chi became very popular, you know, um, you know, now we're in a, we're in a, we're in a time where, you know, Tai Chi is like one of the most popular martial arts on, on the face of the planet, even though it's not generally practiced as a, as a martial art, strictly speaking, you know, it's 
Um, wh what do you think is the future of Tai Chi? Where do you think it's going? Well, it, it will go wherever we drive it. Right. It's, is, is what I want to say. So <laughs> I think it's really important that wherever Tai Chi goes in the future, it needs to maintain some sort of connection to what was done in the past in order to remain valid. <clears throat> and this, this ties in very closely just to the notions of, you know, a culture of face because people will be doing a million different things, uh, which is their right and privilege to do. And they, they will all insist that they were doing Tai Chi and the real experts who can observe what they're doing will just bow out of that conversation. Look, I don't want to get involved in this. I don't want to break anybody's rice bowl. Okay, that's good. But I also don't want to make any statements about better or worse or true and false. And that is something that we have to change. You know, people uh, will pretend that they're being kind and gracious by keeping their mouth shut. But actually, sometimes that's just strictly self-serving behavior. And we need to be able to, to speak frankly, politely, but also frankly about what is Tai Chi and how is it, uh, how it should be practiced, what it means, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. What do you think? I think that's a great answer. I mean, I, I think that, you know, all of these arts are super valuable, um, you know, um, for a variety of reasons. People practice them for a variety of reasons. But I feel like all of the benefits, including the health benefits, are, are dependent on practicing these martial arts as martial arts as much as as much as one can, you know. So I tend yeah. to. Yeah, you know, uh, speaking. Uh, frankly, I, I don't really care about competition at all, which is something that people are surprised to hear. You know, <clears throat> they think that I must be obsessed with competition after all i did it i must be obsessed with it uh they think i must be spending hours and hours training specifically for it we do almost zero competition training in my class just enough that uh, i'm satisfied that people won't get injured which is very important of course but uh that's not my focus at all but we have to engage with these things to uh separate true and false look you know if martial arts is a cultivation discipline you have to acknowledge the existence of true and false. Can't yeah. run from that sort of thing. It's, it's the starting yes. point, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Chris, would you like to tell people where they can find you at? We'll put all of the links um, to your uh, website and YouTube channel in the description. But, um, you know, would you like to just tell anybody where they can find you at or if you have any upcoming um, events you'd like to promote? Uh, I'd love to. So the main website is uh, shorelinetaichi.com. And we have a mailing list that you can put yourself on. Just scroll to the bottom of any page. You'll see a link that says essentially join the mailing list. We use the mailing list to inform people about local and national events. That includes the retreats that we hold every four to six months. And I would welcome uh, anybody of any martial arts discipline do come and join us. I'm sure you'll have a great time. Awesome. All right. Chris Marshall, Shoreline Tai Chi. Thanks a lot for talking to me. <music>